so um, yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, so this is a uh, this is an open economics forum um, discussion on housing. The uh, it's the tenth series. Uh, for those that don't know, Open Economics Forum is a uh, student society out of SOAS, which is part of the Rethinking Economics uh, network uh, aimed at encouraging pluralism in economics. So a little bit of housekeeping to start off with. Um, we're going to hear a 15 minute talk from Josh and Rachel. And during this time, people can post their questions in the chat box on the far right side. Um, and then we'll all those questions together and put them to get put them to Josh and Rachel at the end. Um, so a little bit about everyone. Um, so Josh Ryan Collins is the head of finance and macroeconomics and senior researcher at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose in UCL. Uh, his research takes a cross-disciplinary approach combining economics, economic history and sociology and has a particular focus on credit and land. He's the author of the books, Why Can't You Afford a Home? Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing, and Where Does Money Come From? The Rethinking Economics of Land and Housing, I think, is pretty much a Bible for uh, housing economics, and uh, definitely, definitely one that I would encourage you to go out and read. Um, Rachel White is an organiser within uh, London Apprentice Union. I'm sure she'll explain more about what Lantas Ventures Union does for those who don't know, uh, so I won't take up time to get here. Um, but just in short, it's a member led campaigning union uh, taking action to transform the housing system. Um, London's Renters Union has, in the wake of the current pandemic and economic crisis, called for rent suspension, rent debt cancellation, and protection of renters from eviction. They've just launched their new campaign, uh, hashtag can't pay, won't pay, um, and you can find more details of that at their website, londonsrentersunion.org. Um, our household is actually one of the, the legions that have just only become paid up members since the crisis. So <laughs> there's, lots, there's lots of other people doing the same, I'm aware. Um, my name's Liam Milani. Um, I'm an economist and an active housing campaigner, uh, mainly with a group called Greater Manchester Housing Action. Uh, who tries to connect uh, grassroots with uh, policy-led activism. Without much further ado, I'll hand over to... Um, should I give back on? Um, yeah, we're hoping to bring academics and campaigners together with this, uh, um, this talk, so feel free to place your questions in any and every direction, um, and we'll, we'll go around to answering them at the end. Um, housing has always been touted by politicians as central to our economy, especially in the UK. Um, but when it comes to political action, this is often forgotten. Um, so I'll hand over to Josh, uh, who can basically tell us why that is. <laughs> Off you go. I'll type. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks to the Open Economics Forum at SOAS for inviting me to uh, come and talk about housing and land. It's actually my, been my first opportunity to talk about uh, probably my favourite subject. So I'm very pleased you, you gave me that opportunity. Um, I've got a couple of uh, uh, slides I wanted to show because I think it's quite important when we're thinking about the current situation that we have some historical perspective on what's been happening in the housing market and more broadly in the land market, which of course um, is the underlying economic commodity that we're, we need to focus on when we think about uh, house prices and uh, rent. Um, so um, I will just initially just take you through those, uh, um, but just with the mind to thinking about what the current situation means for for those um, those graphics I'm going to show, but a, but a broader point I suppose I'd like to just start with is the idea uh, uh, the concept of economic rent, 
um, which is um, which is key, I think, to understanding the dynamics we're seeing and some of the um, uh, contested, uh, controversial debates that we're having, including uh, the, the, the this debate about whether or not uh, renters should be given private renters should be given um, uh, should have their rent suspended, as London Renters Union is, is campaigning for. Um, of course, ground rents or the re the rent you pay for your home um, is one form of, of economic rent. But in its broader term, what economic rent refers to essentially is income uh, due to the control over a scarce asset or um, the, 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 the artificial, the, the creation of, of and control over a, a scarce asset. And um, this concept goes back to the founding fathers of economics, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, um, and R David Ricardo. And for them, they're the most important scarce asset through which people could generate income uh, was land. Um, and they had, they, they spent much of their, many of their writings were focused on how you could uh, get around this problem of landowners as economies developed, being able to charge higher and higher land rents or ground rents for the use of land that the demand for which was growing over time as cities expanded and roads were built and services improved um, and the economy grew. And the danger that by, by charging higher and higher rents, they would absorb the economic surplus that society, capitalist societies naturally create. And if they absorb too much of it, uh, people would, more and more of people's incomes would go on paying rents and there would be less and less available for consumption and less and less profit for firms and firms, of course, also paying land rents. And eventually you would end up in a situation of economic stagnation. Uh, now, I think what we're seeing at the moment is we were in a, an era, era of very high land rents already, um, and we've now had a massive hit to uh, people's incomes, to household incomes, and to firms' incomes. Um, but we haven't had a corresponding reduction in the rents that they're being charged by landlords. Um, so that, in a sense, is, is the key tension from an economic theory perspective that we we need to be thinking about. So I'll just share um, a few slides with you. Hopefully everybody can uh, can see these. Um, not sure that's actually working, is it? Uh, yeah, there we go. Just took a while to come through. So this just shows you um, the house price to income ratio in advanced economies. I've, I've taken the average across 15 advanced economies, including the larger economies in Europe and the US. Um, and what you can see there, what's interesting about this chart, so this is essentially a widespread use of affordability, um, because we're, we're not that interested in absolute num numbers when it comes to house prices, we're interested in actually affordability, the ratio between house prices and income. And what's interesting about this chart is it, it sort of shows that there was some sort of uh, equilibrium here uh, around that uh, this is scaled to to 100 um, around um, so nine, nine, the, the average is, is the long is 100 is the long run average it's an index scale so that dotted line is the long run average and what this shows is that up, up until the, the late 1990s there was some kind of equilibrium but then of course we had the financial crisis and a huge rise in house prices and asset prices um, which then collapsed uh, with the financial when the bubble burst in 2008 but then we had a, we've had a very rapid um, return to relative unaffordability since about 2012. So house prices have have um, uh, and actually the most recent data, which is, isn't on this chart, uh, has seen that ratio return almost to the same level as that peak of 2008. So just before COVID hit, um, housing was uh, already at sort of record unaffordable levels. Um, actually in London, I was reading before this talk, house prices had reached their record high um, in, in March of, of this year. So uh, we, were, we, were, we were not in a good situation before the, the crisis hit. Um, if I just, now I need to go to the next slide. Yeah. One result of this is of course that we've had a fall in home ownership in advanced economies um, and in particular in Anglo-Saxon economies actually you've seen this more notably. Um, 
And now what that means from for, from the perspective of, of economic rent, as we're saying at the start, is that the, a smaller and smaller percentage of the population are sharing in that increase in land value uh, that we've seen over time. And um, of course, the ability to, to gain income from actually letting out a second home as a, as a landlord. Um, now, it was a key part of the sort of um, a, a, a catalyst model in Anglo-Saxon economies to have very high rates of home ownership so that a broad mass of citizens could share in, in, the, in, the, in the gains from in the increasing value of their, their homes. But you can see there in that chart that on average across um, Anglo-Saxon economies, that sort of high of 70% home ownership uh, in sort of 2000 has been falling since then. So we're now down to sort of be below 65%. And of course, that slack has been taken up by increases in uh, private private renting. So private renting are increasingly important tenure. Um, now, for me, the key driver of the of the unaffordability of housing, uh, which is is largely sort of neglected by mainstream literature on on housing, although there's some signs of that of that changing in in more recent years is the role of finance and um, in particular uh, the deregulation um, and liberalization of the financial sector which started in anglo-saxon economies in the 1980s but then picked up in european economies as as part of the sort of eu the the creation of the eurozone um, and greater financial harmonization in europe <coughs> um, and um, and financial innovation as well which um, which uh, has uh, this, this process of liberalization encouraged. What you've seen is a shift in bank credit uh, from the sort of 1990s onwards in particular, away from um, the funding of traditional role of banks to fund firms for working capital or capital investment towards uh, supporting the purchase of existing property and existing land. Um, so sometimes we think about mortgages as a very good thing, enables people to, to buy their first home, et cetera. But actually very little mortgage credit supports the building of new homes. Um, rather, the, the general uh, impact in my research has demonstrated is inflate the price of, of existing homes because essentially it's this same point that I started with that land and, and housing and in particular desirable housing in the areas we want to live is inherently scarce. So if you just throw more credit, more money at it when banks make a loan, they create new money out of nothing. There's, they don't borrow the money from elsewhere in the economy. The result, more money chasing the same amount of scarce assets is going to be asset and house price inflation. Um, uh, but, but this has been rather missed by, by the mainstream literature, which has focused much more on um, supply side problems, which in some countries are an issue. But I think in general, it's the financialization of housing. It's the increasing use of housing uh, or, or, or uh, yeah, increasing use of housing as a financial asset rather than a place to live, rather than its sort of use value um, that, has, that has been the problem. And governments have played a key role in that because rather than pushing back against this financialization process, they've subsidized the demand side. So they've seen that people can't afford homes. Um, and rather than reducing the flow of credit into this scarce asset, uh, they've actually um, provided all kinds of subsidies for first home buyers, whether that's mortgage interest rate tax relief, whether it's it's grants for first home buyers, um, the, 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 the various schemes that we've seen in, um, in different countries, equity loans, help to buy in the UK, of course. Now, all this does is it further increases the amount of money flowing into a finite uh, at supply of, of land. So it, it doesn't really help the problem. And of course, the deterioration of the welfare state and people's pensions means there's even more demand for, um, for housing. And this chart just shows my, my argument, really, that, that there's this correlation between this huge expansion in mortgage credit flowing into housing markets and real house prices. So this chart shows the left hand scale is basically more, uh, mortgage credit outstanding as a percentage of GDP, again, averaged across 14 advanced economies and the right hand scale. Um, shows real house prices, the, uh, the blue line there. And you see from the 1990s onwards, you, you see this, cor this very strong correlation. Before then, there's, le there's less evidence of a correlation. 
what all of this means actually is we've had an increase in household debt because people have been taking on more and more debt uh, to buy a, buy a home, particularly again in Anglo-Saxon economies. And again, this makes us very vulnerable to economic shocks such as the pandemic uh, crisis uh, and means we're, we're very poorly a, a adapted uh, to dealing with it when those high rents and those high mortgages are still in place, but our incomes are contracting uh, very rapidly. So this just shows some people say, well, you know, it doesn't matter if there's more debt in the economy um, because of the value of our homes, our assets is going up. But this this chart shows actually that the, there has been a big increase in debt, household debt relative to the housing stock. Um, so it's not like the assets and the liabilities are, are balancing out there. Now, my, my key sort of argument, I suppose, is, um, you know, what, what's interesting to reflect on is, you know, what's going to happen going forward. And as I said at the beginning, what, what you've got is, is people with paying out very big mortgages, um, renters uh, paying a very large proportion of their incomes uh, to landlords um, uh, because of this, uh, this asset, this inflationary cycle I talked about, this housing finance cycle. Um, now, if you just if you cut off their incomes due to increasing unemployment, the result is fairly obvious. Uh, people are going to be unable to pay those mortgages um, or be unable to pay their their rent. Um, and um, this chart is just shows U.S. unemployment and uh, mortgage delinquent mortgage delinquencies, and you can see unsurprisingly. Uh, a very close link between these two variables uh, this, since 2000, it's Oxford Economics data. Um, and of course, what we've seen in the US, even more so than in, in the UK, is a rise in unemployment on an absolutely um, uh, terrifying scale, uh, Great Depression style increase in unemployment. I think the figure is 36 million in the US at the moment. Um, and one can expect um, massive mortgage um, delinquencies um, uh, as a result of that, which will create financial instability uh, problems, of course. Um, now, in the UK and some European countries, we've had uh, this furloughing job retention type schemes in an effort, I think partially, although it's not really talked about by politicians, um, to prevent uh, mass mortgages or people uh, not not paying their 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 rents and, and what's interesting, of course, is there hasn't been that much discussion of that part of the story in the in the in the press and the media. The, the focus has just been we've got to help people keep their jobs um, uh, and and maintain the productive capacity of the economy, which of course is important. Uh, but of course, another function of these types of schemes is it it does maintain those payments through to through to landlords and, and to the rentier sector. And so I, I suppose for me that the question is, does is that, you know, does that make sense? Um, particularly given the fact that, as we know, some many people are not being picked up by these furlough schemes, um, but are still paying uh, high rents, particularly in cities like, like London. Um, but also because um, I think many of these people on these job retention schemes are not going to actually be able to keep their jobs uh, as the furlough scheme winds winds down we're going to see large-scale unemployment uh, in the UK as well and there is going to be this question of, of how people continue to pay their mortgages and their rent so for me there needs to be more thinking about how to deal with that problem and um, I, I have argued uh, even before the COVID crisis that what we need is um, uh, higher taxes on uh, the rentier sector um, and of course, um, in the short term to deal with the COVID crisis, I would support the suspension of rents or the reduction of, of those rental payments um, for those people who out of no fault of their own have been made uh, unemployed due to the, the pandemic. Um, and there, there just hasn't been enough focus on that uh, issue uh, in, the, in the policy uh, debate so far. Um, there's been a bit more support for you know, home builders who no longer have to uh, uh, obey, uh, deliver on their Section 106 agreements or their community interest levy obligations. These are policies that, that, that they have. pay councils a bit of money for the right to develop housing. Um, but much less thinking about how you um, reduce those rents. And, 
from an economic purely obviously there's big inequality issues here but, but as an economist it doesn't make sense to me for the government to be uh, bailing out large industries um, and uh, uh, and other parts of the economy uh, whilst not supporting people um, with these kinds of rentier demands. I mean, it should be the rentier sectors, I think, that should be, um, who have the broadest shoulders, wealthier people who should be um, supporting the economy more heavily. Um, anyway, I'll leave it at, at that um, because I'm sure there's lots more we can, uh, we can talk about. Thank you. And I think um, certainly Rachel have something interesting to put on your on your point about why the government chose the furlough scheme um, in terms of uh, supporting people to pay their rent rather than giving rent holidays um, as London Renters Union have called for. Um, yeah, uh, Rachel, are you ready to to fire yeah. away? Excellent. Um, cool. Thank you very much um, for that drop. That was super interesting, and I'm going to be, I guess, talking about very similar topics just from the perspective of the London Renters Union and our members. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the London Renters Union is a uh, union for private renters um, in London. Um, we have been going for about a year and a half and come from this kind of, I mean, like all unions, the idea is that if we uh, all join forces, there's more of us than there is of them. Um, and we can fight for better conditions in the um, in the house in the housing sector and kind of transform the housing system so that it works in favour of renters rather than landlords. Um, so I'll kind of give a picture of renting um, pre-COVID. I I kind of know that this is a um, student, so I guess like you're all very familiar with um, the how terrible renting is uh, in London. Um, uh, but I guess kind of some of the key things to stress is that uh, the laws um, that protect renters um, are kind of few and far between and it's really difficult to access justice for renters. Um, there's a kind of huge imbal power imbalance between landlords and renters. Um, so for example section 21 evictions means that renters can get kicked out um, through no fault of their own for anything. Um, which makes it really difficult for renters to have justice, for example, when they are complaining about disrepair issues or complaining about a rent increase. You know, the first, um, what we see very often, the first port of call for a landlord is to just evict that person and get in someone new um, really quickly. Um, other issues that we see um, kind of uh, playing out um, for our members are, um, so we have a large number of members who are, uh, migrants and the hostile environment policies mean that uh, migrants and migrant communities uh, really struggle to access um, good quality rental properties. Um, very often uh, landlords uh, will be checking like uh, residency documents and for those with irregular status this pushes them into the hands of um, kind of the worst landlords out there. Um, and another big pro issue that we see is uh, people living in temporary accommodation. So for those of you that don't know, if you present as homeless to your local authority, um, before um, finding you permanent housing, you'll be stuck in temporary accommodation. Um, temporary is a kind of euphemism. We see people in there for years and years, you know, up to like 12, 13 years. Um, I've known people to be in temporary accommodation and it's often incredibly poor quality. So, for example, converted office blocks, um, whole families living in one room and sharing uh, washing and cooking facilities with the whole floor. Um, so in no way fit for um, human habitat. Um, renters in London, I think, so rents are in London are the most expensive in Europe. And on average, so we've got three branches in Hackney, Newham and Lewisham. In Lewisham, renters spend on average about 57% of inco their income on rent and in Hackney and Newham it's 60%. So working people are spending huge amounts of money um, giving it to their landlords each month, often for substandard quality housing. Um, and of course the people that are kind of most impacted by this um, are working people, working class people, um, communities of colour and, um, and, and migrants too. Um, and also younger people because um, uh, yeah, because um, the kind of conditions of when 
we uh, entered into the job market have meant that it's more difficult for us to get on the housing ladder. Um, to be kind of clear, the London Renters Union isn't really keen that like everyone becomes a homeowner, but it is like important to note that home ownership um, is one of the few ways in this country to gain a kind of stable housing situation. Um, and yeah, it's kind of um, kind of to put it in a kind of historical perspective. I mean, under capitalism, housing is always a commodity, but there was a kind of brief period in the uh, post-war period up until like the 1970s where um, that was less so. Um, huge like house building projects and like large numbers of living in council council housing um, and a system of, of rent controls um, meant that this was kind of like balanced and that um, renting was was an affordable um, way for people to live. Um, but a kind of suite of policies and laws brought in in the uh, end of the 80s and in the 90s um, kind of uh, got rid of a lot of those protections. So that's when Section 21 was brought in um, and really encouraged people to like anyone with a bit of money to get on the housing ladder and buy like two, three, four, five properties um, and become landlords and kind of treat those properties as cash cows, often in the place of um, for example, good state pensions um, or, or good pensions in general. So um, a lot of what you see now is people using the property as, as um, in place of a pension. Um, and I th uh, what is it? One in six uh, baby boomers own a second home. So it's, it's clear that there's kind of intergenerational um, kind of issue there. So coronavirus hits. Um, yeah, so uh, in London, as in the rest of the UK and around the world, um, we see huge job losses. Um, we talked, uh, Josh talked about like the furlough schemes and the um, other schemes that are there to replace people's income. Um, you know, those are pretty decent schemes. I, you know, it's not often that I uh, say nice things about the Tory government, but they are pretty decent. Um, but of course they don't cover everyone and what we're seeing with our members, um, a lot of whom are young, um, potentially, you know, in their 20s, um, have definitely been, if they're self-employed, been self-employed for less than three years, which disqualifies them from accessing, accessing that benefit. And a lot of people uh, who are migrants who don't have access to public funds, which means that they're disqualified from those benefits too. Um, the government also banned evictions for three months, which is good. In, in a way, like it's good for three months. Um, we have still seen some illegal evictions take place. Um, landlords are on this, um, but it's good for three months, but it does just kick the problem further down the line. Um, and we're expecting to see a huge wave of evictions happening um, when uh, evictions are allowed back up again. Um, landlords, are, landlords have been asked by the government to show clemency towards their tenants, um, but this obviously isn't happening. Um, Landlords are still demanding full rents and what we're seeing with our members is people taking out loans to pay their rent, um, using their savings to pay their rent, entering into debt repayment plans, which they're just never going to um, be able to pay back. Like I think, like Josh, I agree that it's, it's very clear that a lot of the jobs that um, did exist aren't coming back and the likelihood of someone being able to repay um, additional on top of what they were already paying in their rent is just is just kind of um, not going to happen um, and we're also seeing people who are having to go to work even though they don't feel safe um, in order to pay in order to pay rent um, I'll give a quick example of one of our members who lives in Gloucester Court which is a block of flats in in Herne Hill um, he is a nurse working on an ICU his partner lost her income um, she was working in events and that has obviously completely dried up. Um, Aaron, the nurse, um, was paying before the crisis 60% of his income on rent and is now being asked by his, his landlord who uh, is a multimillionaire and this weekend moved from number 53 to number 52 on the Sunday Times Rich List um, to enter into a rent repayment plan to pay um, their rent back uh, once uh, his partner starts earning again. But I mean, if you're on 60% of, if you're already paying 60% of your wage on rent, there's really not much left for you to be paying um, a rent repayment plan on, on top of that too. Um, so it's kind of a really unrealistic, unrealistic demand that's coming in from landlords. Um, 
so what should be done we have started a campaign called can't pay won't pay um which is asking people to hold withhold part or all of their rent um particularly people who have lost income during the crisis um we're hoping to build a mass of people who are withholding rent in order to pressure the government to um concede to our five demands which are suspending rent so we want rent to be suspended throughout the duration of this crisis uh, no rent debt which means that we don't want anyone to be uh, building up debt towards that to the landlords um, during this crisis. The evictions ban to be made permanent, so um, that would be for Section 21 to be um, abolished. The uh, Theresa May government actually kind of um, agreed to do this, but nothing has come of it, um, and we'd like to see that, uh, that gone for good. Um, rent controls, so um, in order to build back a system that is um, much more livable for Londoners. We'd like to see rent controls in, uh, introduced um, to bring down the price uh, of housing, uh, of rents um, in London, and an end to borders in housing. So that would be ending um, passport checks that, that people face when they, uh, when they um, are renting, and also an end to no recourse to public funds, which uh, is the thing that stops migrants from accessing the benefit system. Um, so it's, you know, it's really important that people have enough money to keep themselves healthy. And so we're kind of asking people to prioritise their immediate needs ahead of that of their landlords. Um, renters shouldn't be shouldering the debt of this crisis. Um, and it's really clear that, you know, this, any money that um, is renters are now giving to their landlords is just going back into, into the landlord's pockets. It's, it's profit. And um, this is a time for for us actually to not be um, just handing over profit to people, especially when it comes from um, the government purse. Like, uh, you know, there's already a huge transfer of wealth um, to landlords through uh, housing benefit, which is uh, housing benefit and local housing allowances, um, which are the benefit that you get if you need support with your, with your housing costs. Um, and that goes to your landlord. So that's already, uh, already a huge transfer um, of state money to private pockets. Um, in the UK, we spend 13 billion pounds a year on housing benefits, so it's not an insignificant sum. Um, and we want to see something like uh, the New Economics Foundation, New Economics Foundation's policy. Um, they are calling for a suspension to rent, for, bleh, for a suspension of rent, and to create a special benefit for landlords if they need to, like. Uh, cover their subsistence costs during the crisis or and beyond, but not something that covers their profit. Um, other policy organisations, other other housing organisations like Shelter, are arguing that we should increase the amount of housing benefit um, so that people can pay their landlords. But we uh, agree with that policy on the basis that it's again handing loads of money uh, to landlords, and it should be. Um, you know, housing landlords buy housing in a, as an investment, and they kind of shouldn't be the public purse propping up their their kind of personal investment. Um, so, going forwards, I think that I mean, who knows what this government is going to do? I find it very hard to predict um, which way they're going to move. I think that it's very possible that they'll give into these demands, and I think that the pressure is likely to come uh, from local authorities. Um, as they are facing a huge eviction crisis um, and um, kind of something that we'd also like to see uh, that's been a kind of something that we've uh, often talked about in the past is um, giving councils the power to repossess empty homes um, that can be used to house people. So kind of, again, building a, a bigger stock of housing for people uh, to live in um, following the crisis. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll, I'll kind of sum up now. Um, coronavirus in the housing system has, um, yeah, like like with pretty much everything else, uh, has kind of laid bare how broken the system is. Um, I feel, you know, I would I would be hesitant to say I feel optimistic. In fact, I feel incredibly pessimistic. I think we're walking into a massive, massive homelessness crisis unless something is done about this. And done about it quickly um, but one positive uh, I think is that 
there is a level of uh, political education and consciousness raising going on because lots of people are looking at you know their rent payment suddenly as a political thing like why do i pay my landlord so much um when i'm actually not getting paid myself and it causes people to question that whole system um which for a group like us whose aim is to radically overturn the whole system um is a good thing so yeah thank you very much um yeah so just um just to remind people that they can write um any questions they've got in the chat on the right um we're just starting to get a few questions come through now um so while while we're just pulling them together and seeing um how we can ask them um i'll put forward um some questions that we prepared before um and i guess on, either, on these questions, they'll probably fall more into one of either your areas of special expertise, but feel free to, um, for anyone to talk on them. Um, so the first, the first question I'd like to ask is, um, how, how specifically to Rachel, but also for Josh, how do you think that the, um, the atmosphere during this crisis will act as a catalyst for collective action? And um, what things do you think could you see getting in the way of such collective action? Um, so the biggest thing that's getting in the way of collective action at the moment is the fact that we can't see each other. Um, it's uh, we organise as a union mostly um, in person. Obviously, we've had to move everything online, which has um, been a huge shift. And what we get when you move everything online is that you, um, it's very difficult to connect with, uh, go out and kind of build those connections and, um, and reach people who don't have access to, um, to the internet or, you know, don't have access to the technology that they need to, um, to, uh, yeah, to join in. Um, I think there's also something about how quickly this is all happening. Um, so for example, like if you were going to do a rent strike, you would spend like years and years probably planning and organizing and talking to all the people that you need to get involved in building the power. Um, we've had like two months basically to organize a campaign, which is in some ways, I guess, similar to a rent strike, but in many ways not um, because of that. Um, but on the other hand, I guess the kind of like, the peculiarity about the situation is that everyone is going through something together like obviously we're, we're going through it in different ways and um and uh people are affected by it very differently um but the fact that there are so many people right now experiencing the exact same problem with the housing um creates a really kind of interesting moment for us to try and capture and, and build on and collectivize and 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 really we can be speaking to you know hundreds and hundreds of people at the same time about the exact same thing um whereas you know in normal times you'll be speaking to one person about their heating and one person about their hot water and one person you know but it really um is something that we're all going through uh together collectively and and hopefully that kind of um emboldens or or kind of um yeah increases our capacity to to, to act collectively Uh, Jeff, do you want to add anything to that, or should we move on to another question? Um, well, I think um, Rachel summed it up quite well. I mean, I think I think that, that she's right that, that there is a sort of um, things are moving so fast. Uh, I mean, you, you kind of come up with a, a policy idea, uh, and then the, the next day it's sort of no longer relevant because the government's you know moved on and done something that that means it's no longer it sort of no longer works. I mean, I'm finding it challenging in it across a range of areas. Um, I do think though that um, you know it sort of illustrates a, a rather fundamental point that these these rents, these rent rent payments um, uh, are dependent on income, right? They are dependent on the economy functioning uh, at firms paying uh, households money and households then then paying 
um, uh, paying their, their their mortgages or their or their rent. And if you if you simply break off the start of that flow of income by virtue of, of closing down a, a firm and, uh, or unemployment, it's just completely unreasonable to then expect that rent payment to still be to still be made. You know that 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 rent payment is 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 in a sense the um, it's a form of, of wealth extraction rather than wealth creation. It, the, the wealth creation is the first part of the of the cycle. So I do think this this is a critical moment for for us to sort of sit down and sort of face that reality because what we've seen over the last thirty years is the uh, the rent payment getting larger and larger whilst incomes have been stagnating essentially. I mean median real median incomes have, have stagnated not only in the UK but in advanced economies. So in a sense that tension between larger and larger rents, whether it's mortgages or, or it's or it's private rent, ground rent and income, we, we've now reached breaking point essentially with this with this crisis. So so the opportunity for more radical interventions is definitely there. Nice. I think I think we can use that to segue quite nicely into the next question um, because you know when we talk about you, you talk about um, that most most people can see that if you're asking for people to continue their rent payments while they're not getting extra income that that's that's an odd policy but I think that comes down to the political economy of how our government makes policy. So we've got we've got a couple of questions along those lines here. Um, one says, uh, how can the government reverse the housing credit feedback dynamic considering the large percentage of home ownership in the UK and the reliance on equity withdrawal to prop up stagnating wages and I, th I thought this like this links into um, Josh what you talk about in your book about how um, over the sort of the thatch years and then even moving forward into sort of uh, the cons current conservatives government's approach to social housing you talk about a political economy shift towards home home ownership. Yeah. Um, um, I, I noticed though that um, home ownership in the UK, uh, as a percentage, is actually quite low. I mean, you said on the graph, you showed that it's declined, but um, of the Euros, of the Eurostat uh, countries I looked at, it, it was ranked 31 out of 35. So why is our political economy still so dominated by home ownership? Even despite actually not such a high level of ownership. Yeah, that's a that's a, that's a good question, um, and I'll try and address the question from the audience as well. Um, I think part of the reason is that um, vested interests, the 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 people that make decisions um, in Parliament, um, the, uh, you know, the the development sector, the the banking sector, which makes a lot of money out of um, uh, a sort of policy arrangement that favours home ownership over other forms of tenure um, um, are all invested in this model essentially and they're invested in the what I call the housing finance feedback cycle whereby um, incre an increased flow of credit uh, raises house prices, uh, increases developer profits, increases the, the, the size of mortgages people need to borrow, increases the rents they have to pay um, and it, uh, and then increases incomes at the top of the um, uh, socioeconomic distribution. Um, and you know, unfortunately, I think I think there's been some research that shows something like 80% of MPs have second homes. You know, they're part of the. Sadly, they're they're sort of also invested in this um, in this problem. So, the, from a political economy perspective, there is just a power. Uh, problem here where those people making the decisions have, have got vested interests. However, having said all of that, um, I do think we are gradually, uh, particularly in a city like London, nearing a sort of tipping point where um, you, you will get a majority of people who are uh, not homeowners either or, or, or are um, potentially are homeowners but have such huge mortgages that they are um, essentially on the breadline struggling to, to, to make payments having to cut their um, expenditure on other sort of vital goods and services um, and there may be a, a constituency uh, a political constituency which which clearly Rachel is is you know trying to mold in her work at London's renters Union um, to mobilize uh, for more radical interventions um, and I think you see that dynamic happening in in other cities in the UK as well, perhaps. 
um, and in other countries um, whereby we have had this fall in home ownership and even for the people who own their own homes um, older wealthier people they're worried about what how their children are going to be able to afford to buy a home uh, in the nice area where they you know where they're living or, and to have the same quality of sort of home life and space that they've got used to so I think even homeowners are starting to question the, the sort of current arrangement I mean just to answer the question about breaking the, this this cycle I make a number of I've made a number of proposals I do think the taxation system is key I think we need to be taxing um, those those rents those land rents I would propose a annual land value uh, tax sort of Henry George solution so that that would be a tax that just just taxes the increase in the the value of the land it doesn't tax the, the structure of the property on top of the land so if you put in a new kitchen you're not going to be taxed more money just because you've, you've, you've made an improvement to your home but if you live in an area where there's a new railway line has gone in or where there's more general economic development and the value of your wealth has gone up through no effort of your set of your own that's a very efficient tax because you're you're not constraining anyone's income or or any form of investment by by industry and actually i think we need to see a broader shift away from taxing incomes um and on to taxing rents which which you know actually all economists essentially agree on um whether you're left wing or, or right wing um i do i do think that the key issue here is to separate the the land value from from the the property price and and another and another proposal that we might want to be thinking about be thinking about is some sort of um, national housing um, bank of some sort um, uh, or, or even on a more regional level providing local authorities um, with the capacity to um, purchase land or purchase property um, I, I, under circumstances where ha maybe house prices are falling rapidly people can't afford to repay their mortgages they're in negative equity or they can't pay their rents as, as we have now the, the the state could come in and essentially um, take some equity in, or even buy that buy the house and the land in full and the owner of that house who is in negative equity or can't pay their rent then pays the the local authority or the state according to their need without them being thrown out of their house basically so th there's various different ways you might do this and obviously it costs a lot of money um, but we are now in a in a world of you know essentially negative interest rates. The government has just today, I think, um, issued uh, negative um, bond issued bonds with negative interest rates. The UK government, that is, Germany's been doing it for a while. So um, you know it's kind of crazy not to be investing in our housing stock and infrastructure um, when it's essentially free uh, to borrow. Uh, and that, and we need to see much more ambition, I think, uh, from um, the national government and and local government to deal with this with this crisis. I mean, house prices are projected to fall by you know 16 percent according to the to the Bank of England. It's it's hard to know, I think, exactly what will will happen. But um, should that happen, um, that then we do need to think seriously about how we prevent evictions and, and negative equity and, and a sort of more serious collapse in, in the housing market. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got a question here. It says, um, how would you respond to Shadow Housing Secretary uh, Thangam Debener, did I pronounce that right? Who suggested that the rent suspensions are a regressive policy as they would also benefit those who don't need it. Uh, what conditions could be put in place to ensure that only those who need help are covered? Rachel, do you, do you want to come in on that? Um, yeah, I would come in and say that I uh, don't agree that it's aggressive and that I think that it should apply to all rents, not just like those who've lost income. Um, my reason uh, for that is that um, when you mean to test things or when you kind of make things conditional, you inevitably lose out as we've seen with the furlough schemes and the kind of self-employment um, scheme as well um, and yeah for me I just think it's really important like <laughs> that uh, everyone is covered um, by this uh, by a suspension of rents I also think it's um, 
important to think about like how this crisis like is affecting people so even if um like maybe i haven't lost my job that doesn't mean that like you know there's still a level of uncertainty around around what my future is um and for me to be like you know, still adding to my landlord's profit is kind of um yeah it's not my priority i um accept that that's maybe like a little bit of a radical position and like um, the london renters union uh kind of positions itself in opposition to landlords um i agree that that's maybe not like the most um kind of, uh yeah a policy that would um sit well with everyone but yeah just to just to ensure that like no one food falls through the net um I would, I would make it universal. I'm um, sorry, and also just to point out, like, um, there are lots of things that are universal, like our healthcare, that people could pay for. Um, you know, I could probably, if I, you know, I could probably afford uh, private healthcare, but that doesn't mean that it's a, a regressive policy um, because it's universal. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, we've got a couple of questions regarding home office and um, working from home. Um, obviously, this has become one of the surprising things of this crisis, and uh, a lot of people found they able to do their jobs at home. So, um, Hannah asks, there's a lot of talk on the decline of the office lately, which may have effects on the importance of location in urban development. I wondered if you had any thoughts on how Slash if this might be relevant to housing and land values for the medium to longer term. Um, and then I think this links into Joanna's question, which asks, uh, what are your views on permitted development rights um, for the quality of homes, especially for those on lower incomes, in light of the new COVID-19 uh, situation? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that first. Um question could you repeat that Tom? yeah sure um they're essentially asking um whether the increasing amount of uh home office work that's being done is going to affect urban development and what this means in terms of house prices and that housing and land situation in terms of the reconfiguration of people's cities i guess other right I, I can have a get have a Brief go at that, although Rachel may may have a better idea of what's what's going on. I mean, so I think what what you've seen with this crisis, particularly in sort of cities like London, is um, a lot of people have suddenly realised that they can do their job um, from you know any any part of the country. <laughs> they don't need to be actually living in in London, um, and uh, so as a result, many of them have um, you know left there uh, stopped paying high rents and gone and, and lived either with you know their parents or with with friends um in another part of the country where their their rents are significantly lower um because they you know they can do the job just as well um and and perhaps there's there's you know uh, not much indication that there will be a return to work in in the near future i mean that that seems to be changing perhaps with government policy but uh, uh, I mean, I don't know the data on this. Rachel may, may know better than me, but uh, anecdotally, that's what I've heard. That a lot of people are. I mean, I, I've been. My I've had a builder who I know who's who's told me that many of his Polish um, workers have returned to Eastern Europe because they they simply don't have any work, but they're paying these very high rents here in in London. There's more work um, in Eastern Europe for them, and that that means uh, for him that that he simply has no labour. Um, to to carry on. So, um, with regard to urban, I mean, so if, if that if that if that dynamic is is quite large, that would one would expect put downward pressure on house prices and on rents um, in a city like London, um, even if there is a sort of medium term uh, recovery. In particular, I suppose if employees become more relaxed about people working at home on a permanent basis. And of course, this is a great experiment in doing that. And I think a lot of employees are probably realizing that they can trust workers to, you know, to work at home um, permanently. And they don't need to be paying sky high rents in, in London in order to, to do their work. Uh, 
Um, yeah, just to add a little bit to that. So that's exactly what um, what we're seeing anecdotally as well. People um, often just, you know, they've lost their job. Uh, why pay London rent when you could uh, move back in with your parents as well? I mean, it's not necessarily a choice, but um, people kind of moving back with parents or friends in places that um, are outside London um, because it's just not worth paying the rent, uh, especially when you don't have any of the benefits of London living, like everything flows. Um, I would hope that this um, sees a decline of the uh, the city centre just being used um, for, for kind of work purposes. Um, that's my personal point of view. Uh, I find central London very depressing and that is because of uh, the kind of huge increase in um, just like a decrease in people actually living there, increase in uh both office space and like luxury apartments that no one can, can afford or most people can't afford um on the question of permitted development rights so if I, am i right in thinking that this is the like thing that allows you to turn an office into a dwelling uh without any kind of um planning permission or with like hardly any planning permission uh i am not a against that in theory but I do think that it's really well it's really important when you're building any housing that it's like uh, good quality mm -hmm. and like fit for human habitation and beyond that like a nice space for people to live in um if it's possible to convert all those you know empty office blocks that are sitting in central London right now into housing like fantastic um uh you know theoretically I'm not against that um but you know whether that's possible is a different question and um yeah if it is going to happen then it should be done uh, properly and with um residents uh in mind uh, rather than just like landlords and property developers excellent yeah we'll just we'll, i think we'll just try and squeeze in one last question before um, i ask for some closing statements from you guys um dylan maxwell asked um is there any models for radical social housing policy that you feel could be transferable at least partially to the UK context. And he says the programs in Vienna and in Kerala come to my mind. Well, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not that familiar with the Austrian or Kerala um, housing uh, programs, but I mean, obviously, I, my understanding in Austria is uh, that um, much of the land in the city is still publicly owned and they've resisted quite effectively um, the sort of privatization of, of that land um, and as a result they have managed to maintain relatively uh, lower prices and, and they have quite a sophisticated social renting um, provision. Um, although they have had, and I gave a talk there uh, just about six months ago, they, they have had a spike in, uh, in, in house prices uh, recently they haven't been immune to the sort of uh, housing finance cycle, I think. Um, and there's pressure on that model, as far as I, I understand. But, but as I was saying earlier, I think now is the time for a, for a sort of broader re-evaluation re of how we treat land um, in, you know, uh, in the economy. You know, I mean, what is the, what is, how should we tax it? Um, should we lend against it to the degree we currently do should the primary purpose of of land and the way it's uh, the, the land market be the provision of affordable secure decent quality housing and space for business as well um, to operate um, or should it should we continue with a system which essentially um, supports rent extraction and um, essentially continue with it as a financial asset I mean, that's the that's the sort of big question if we're not asking that question now in the middle of essentially i think the worst recession uh, in our lifetimes that we're now facing um that then we're, we're sort of really missing a trick um yeah i again i don't know uh, enough about either of the systems to see which would be better transported to uh to the uk um but at the renters union our kind of dream utopian city is one in which, uh, or city or kind of country is one in which landlordism, landlordism is abolished and that housing is either um, 
uh, you know, potentially through home owned through home ownership, um, but also by local authorities and by co-ops too. And um, we'd like to see a high level of democracy in 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 people's housing. So, um, you know, uh, people who are going to live in that housing deciding like how it's built and where it's built and what decisions are made um, over the building use. Um, I think it's important to note that whilst social housing is like is kind of seen as this um, uh, this amazing thing, and in many ways it is or it was when it existed properly. Um, it wasn't perfect, or it's not perfect. You know, local authority controlled housing isn't perfect, and it would be great to bring um, a kind of uh, a collective democracy um, to our housing, to our cities, um, and to our kind of urban spaces or kind of spaces in general. Excellent. So, yeah, thank you. And um, uh, uh, London Renters Union actually did a May Day online Zoom rally where they uh, had some different people from around the world talking about their approaches to the crisis. So um, you can go, you can find that on their Facebook page. It was recorded and you can check that out. Um, yeah. Any any final final remarks from you guys? Uh, Rachel, first. Um, not really. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, if you're a renter in London, please do uh, join the Renters Union and uh, like take a look at our campaign webpage and get involved. If um, yeah, if you you are struggling uh, with your rent or if you want to show, show solidarity with those who are. And Josh. Uh, no, no, I've really enjoyed the the session. Thanks everyone for for listening in. Um, I mean, I, I would just probably promote my latest book, Why Can't You Afford a Home? If you if you want a fairly concise summary of, of my ideas, um, uh, and hopefully some of those ideas are still useful in today's post-COVID uh, recovery sphere. Okay, thanks guys for a genuinely inspiring um, words to see us through this, uh, the next coming uh, times up ahead. Um, I'd also like to say a quick thank you to uh, Marie and Ollie, um, for, who are the organisers behind this web, webinar, and also Janis de Fermis and Sarah Stevino, who have been um, on the, on the uh, faculty side helping out. Um, the next webinar in the series will be uh, number 11, where we'll be discussing uh, the COVID-19 healthcare crisis, uh, Greece and the EU with Orania and Dimaku. Um, however, this it's been um, the time of the uh, event has been changed, so it's now on Monday the 26th, uh, coming up but still at the same time three to four um yeah thank, thank you again for everyone involved and for everyone who tuned in and uh stay safe take care join the union thank you thanks uh...